All right, uh, everybody. It's a pleasure to welcome all of you to our next um, YouTube session here. And today we're going to talk about IHIMO. And with me, I have a colleague, um, Nilja Gidna from Home Dallas is United, who, who is going to discuss with me all the ups and downs of what we do. So, Nilja, welcome. And I was going to take a minute here and have you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you and what you're doing today. Welcome. Well, Shiva, as you know, it's always a pleasure. You and I could chat forever. <laughs> um, and I am the executive director, as you can see, with Home Dialyzers United. Uh, we are a small uh, uh, patient-run organization for the home dialysis community. Uh, and, you know, we've been, I think I first met you almost eight years ago now when uh, at one of our meetings. So uh, it's always, as I said, always a pleasure to be here. So tell us a little bit about Home Dialysis United, because I think it'd be good to understand so our mission is we, we um, inform, we inspire, and we advocate. And we provide education. Um, we have several, a support group, which is both private and a public one, where we try to provide education, studies, anything related to the home dialysis community. And we do a lot of advocacy work because we're, we're really strong believers in the fact that, you know, the only people that are responsible for making things better is us. So we do uh, work with uh, all of uh, congressional leaders on the Hill. Uh, we collaborate with the other organizations that do advocacy and KF, AKF, ASN. <clears throat> and um, so this is really, and we're right now in a really important time with COVID and uh, has made home dialysis even more important in order to protect patients by having them do their dialysis at home and not in a center where they can be exposed. So we've just been busier than ever <laughs> and uh, getting things uh, to help patients stay at home. So can you talk a little bit about the issues around COVID and dialysis, maybe a little bit before we sort of get into IHEMO and why uh, there are specific challenges that your population has to deal with? So when COVID hit, I'm going to tell you, it was scary. I had already been doing home dialysis for eight years, thank goodness. Um, but my heart went out to the patients that were every week at the face with the fact that they had to go to a clinic and for a life-saving treatment. And yet going to that clinic had a very real probability of exposing them to the COVID virus. And early on, it was pretty deadly. Um, this is the first year, believe it or not, as the data came in to the USRDS, which is where they collect all of the dialysis data for everything, <clears throat> that we actually had a reduction in dialysis patients. And sadly, it wasn't because um, you know, they were getting better, it was because they were dying. And that, that's a scary thought in the fact that that many patients died from COVID. And a lot of that could have been protected, prevented had those patients already been doing home dialysis or been able to make that transition quickly. Um, and we just don't have either of those in place. So hopefully moving forward, people are starting to see the advantages. Um, you know, I, for the first year of COVID, I never went set foot in a clinic or a hospital, um, you know, because there were hotbeds and knock on wood, I've been COVID free. <laughs> so uh, you know, this is a really important thing to look because I don't think we're never going back to normal and the future is probably going to hold more of the same. So home dialysis, being able to do your treatments at home is going to be critically important to the future of healthcare. <clears throat> yeah, so we're going to talk today about a technology uh, we're working on uh, called iHemo. And what I'll do is uh, play a little video that some of you in the audience may have already seen, but I think it will refresh us as to what IHEMO is. And what I'd like for all of you to understand is that for our team here in the Kidney Project, the IHEMO is one feature of what we do, but re is really integral to the ultimate goal of the Kidney Project, which is building an implantable artificial kidney. So let me go ahead and play this video 
and then we can talk about it on the other side. So, all right, now I gotta figure out how to start my screen and then we'll do it. So here we go. Let's share my sound. All right. Here we go. In reach of end stage renal disease patients. Featuring a surgically implanted blood filter, iHemo will enable patients to dialyze themselves at home. The process is simple. There are no needles and no blood leaves the body, eliminating the fear of blood loss from an accidental disconnect or equipment malfunction. iHemo offers the kind of dialysis patients say they prefer, and it's compact compared to the machines used in dialysis centers. Clinical data show clear advantages to frequent and prolonged hemodialysis compared to fewer and shorter sessions at dialysis centers. These advantages include improved survival, blood pressure, heart function, quality of sleep, cognitive function, and pregnancy outcomes. Patients will need less time to recover after sessions and can enjoy greater dietary freedom. In the iHemo dialysis system, the hemofilter is surgically implanted inside the patient's abdomen. The hemofilter connects to the circulatory system on one side and on the other side to catheters leading to a small external pump. Inside the hemofilter are highly efficient biocompatible blood filtration membranes made possible by advances in silicon nanotechnology. Because the membranes are compact, the hemofilter is small enough to implant. The patient's heart pumps blood through the hemofilter while the external pump sends dialysate into the hemofilter and carries away toxins and excess water. Development of the iHemo dialysis system has progressed steadily. It's been prototyped and tested on the lab bench. Surgical techniques for implantation have been refined and the system has been tested in animals with positive results. With the refinement of iHemo, Dialysis patients will experience greater mobility. The implanted hemofilter and portable dialysate pump enable patients to travel freely. The first implantable dialysis system, iHemo. All right, so what you've seen here is basically the vision of iHemo and some of the work we're doing towards that goal. I think what's important to understand is that this is integrally related to what we're doing for the implantable artificial kidney. And it is not a separate effort in the sense that this is all, this is a separate track. We're taking the technology that we are developing from the implantable artificial kidney. And many of you in the audience know it comprises of a filter unit and a cell therapy unit to provide many of the functions like a transplant would, and the implantable artificial kidney would be wholly contained, completely implanted, no external connections. So the iHemo takes the half of the implantable artificial kidney, the filter half, and we're using that same core technology to enable implanted dialysis and the learnings we've brought in from that implantable artificial kidney is what's driving the technology development here. But what's really driving us is some of the feedback we've gotten from patients about trying to make home therapies more accessible. And the implantable artificial kidney is, is one way to think about it. The iHemo is another way to think about it. So that's a nutshell. Yeah, Shiva, well, the first time you ever told me about iHemo, I literally got chills. I mean, it was an exciting, I, I, I got it right away. And I was like, this is just amazing. Uh, and having followed it over the years, I agree. I mean, it's just a step in, you know, while we are moving towards the implantable kidney, it's a way to make this step work for, for patients in the interim 
as they're, you know, you getting to the kidney. And also, you know, patients can use it even when there is an implantable kidney as a step towards that, that implantable, um, you know, say they have, still have residual or partial function and just need a little bit of di dialysis. Um, so there's just so many options that I'm excited about in terms of the, the IHEMA, so. <clears throat> so I guess, you know, one of the things that, you know, I've gotten people to ask it is, you know, ask me is, now, how is it similar and how is it different? And I've sort of hinted already that it's a mechanical unit that has the filter half, but not the cell half. But what do you have? You have the filter is still surgically put in. So I think that's important for people to appreciate. It's actually implanted. Mm -hmm. And once it's implanted, it's connected to the blood vessels inside the patients. And what you have is two catheters coming out of through, you know, we just say around the belly, it can be different locations, but conceptually we thought it, it's, you know, around the belly, kind of like PD. Uh, but the idea is that then you would connect the, these two catheters, they're connected to the dialysis pump. So what you have is external dialysate that gets pumped in to the patient, into the filter, which is inside the patient and then circulates and through dialysis removes, you know, whatever has to be removed from the bloodstream. Now, two features. One is because the filter is completely implanted and blood is only passing on one side of the filter, blood never leaves the body. So that's, I think, a difference than the standard hemodialysis. So blood is always inside the body. And what you have is a dialysis solution coming, coming out of the body and it's coming out through a catheter pair uh, or dual lumen catheter, whatever it is, um, so that only the outside sees the dialysis solution. So there's no chance for blood connections or needles in this system. And the technology is such that the blood is driven through the filter just by the body's blood pressure alone. That's sort of a feature of our technology because we're able to make them out of silicon and arrange them in parallel plate structure, a little more technical information here. You actually have such a low resistance that you do not need a pump to drive blood. Just this effect of the blood pressure is sufficient to drive blood through the device. And then as dialysis, which is being pumped from the outside, it pulls out through a process called diffusion, the toxins from blood. And once you're done, you disconnect the dialysis catheter. The blood side keeps on running. There's no, but there's nothing else to, there's no external connection. So the dialysis solution just sits in there until you connect it again. So the blood side is always running through the filter. You don't have to stop it and start it, which can cause its own problems. There's no blood pump, mechanical blood pump that can cause hemolysis for some of you who know, or destruction of red blood cells. And on the other side, if for some reason uh, you wanted to um, stop dialysis and take a trip, you just carry your pump and solution and you take that with you and your filters inside. And that is the vision that I think was driven partly by folks like, you know, you and other patients, because those patients said, you know, Travel is really important. Being able to have a quality of life is really important. And yes, you know, if even if you use your technology to make dial dialysis better, that'd still be a step enough for us. And we thought, gosh, not only is it a step good for them, it advances our technology because we're still improving the membranes. Okay. We're figuring out how to do the surgical techniques. And hopefully this is another, you know, you and I have talked, another uh, tool in the toolkit yep. of the Christian community. So what, what I know what I hear is no needles, and I'm sure that that's really exciting for patients. Um, and another aspect of this is if you could explain a little bit more about the similarities to PD and the differences. Someone just asked a question about being able to shower and swim, you know, with this catheter as opposed to like uh, a PD catheter. So if you have a little more detail in that. Yeah, sure. So the catheter would be closed with a catheter lock solution. That's, that's, that's the vision. And you are not 
So let's first talk about the similarities with PD because I think that's important. So the similarities are on the outside, you have a pump that only has dialysis solution. You connect it, not with needles, but it's some sort of a lure lock type fixture. Yeah. So you don't actually have to worry about sharp needles or puncturing blood vessels, et cetera. And then you have a button, you press and the machine runs, okay? And you do not need to worry about, you know, what happens if there's a disconnect? Well, some dialysis will fall, that's it. You don't have to worry about, you know, will my blood clot in the lines? Well, there's no blood coming out, so there's yeah. no blood clotting, right? Uh, then, uh, you'll, then you'll think about, well, how simple is the machine? We think it can be simple enough. It's basically dialysis pump solution. So you actually can make it a lot smaller than the machines you see that are for the hemodialysis, including some of the more compact versions, because we don't have to have a blood pump. Just that simplifies that part of it. So what are the, uh, some of the differences? One is on a, the way it's connected, it's connected to blood vessels inside. And it's connected through vascular grafts. The same kind of technology used to make AV shunts, or you have to make vascular grafts for people who have had to replace blood vessels. Technology that has been around for decades. It'll connect to the device. So the blood is flowing through it. It is not, inside the peritoneum. Yes. So you're not violating the peritoneal space, which as some of you know, is sacred. That's where you have a lot of risk of infections and not only infections, serious infections that if you recover from it, cause scarring and ultimately have you have required that you go off PD. So we're going to have this eye hemofilter implanted through grafts Similar on the outside, like a PD interface on the operation, but internally, we're not going to the peritoneum. We can modulate, adjust the level of treatment like you do for hemodialysis. Yeah. So you'll be able to get if I'm, you know, the benefits that you may associate with hemodialysis of a PD, but with the simplicity of a PD and avoiding some of the complications associated running you know, hemodialysis. So the risk of infection is gonna be a lot less, especially because the peritoneum is not involved, which is what's the, the vulnerable aspect of a per, doing a peritoneal dialysis. Um, and blood infections are, are often caused during dialysis by exposure. How will, will there be protections against that as well? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think, you know, we should just be clear that anytime you have something grow through the skin, there's always the risk of infection. <laughs> so we should all be aware of that, right? So what you do is try to, you know, manage that risk and do it the best possible way. So we have a couple of things that are inherent in the design of iHemo that probably mitigate some of the uh, adverse likelihoods of infection. What is that? So let's first compare with PD and you sort of hinted at it. We're not going to the peritoneum and when, so that we're not actually having that same kind of risk when you violate the peritoneal space. So we take that off the table. Now you say, okay, so this is a hemodialysis. So what are the challenges of infection with hemodialysis? Well, anytime you have a catheter, you do, but remember in a CVC, central venous catheter line that goes into your bloodstream, if you think of a catheter as a tube that has an outer surface and an inner lumen, tubing part, hollow part, the hollow part and the outer part both go into the blood vessel. They get threaded in and they both go into the blood vessel. So if you have a bug, a germ, get in, it can travel either through the hollow part, the lumen, into the blood, or it can travel through the top into the bloodstream because you have you know, sticking to the bloodstream. Now, we also have a catheter that goes inside. So there's always a risk of some infection, but we actually do not go into the bloodstream. We go into the device. So in the hollow part of the tube or the hollow, the hollow part of the catheter, where the dialysis solution comes in, if you have a bug, it, go, it can go in, but it meets the filter of IHEMA. And the filter is good at keeping things out. It lets, you know, urea, creatinine, go through sugars and salts, let's let bugs go through one or the other. So you actually have that protection 
by the design. The membrane that's in the filter that is connected to the dialysis pump outside acts as a barrier to pathogens going from the lumen of the catheter into the bloodstream. So that's one. Second, we're not sticking the catheter into the bloodstream, but on the device. So the, while there's a theoretical possibility you'll get bugs on the outside of the catheter uh, that can migrate into the body and cause an infection, it will not actually go directly into the bloodstream right away. And it, that, so in that sense, it mitigates or minimizes the likelihood of a serious blood infection. Now, as I said, you can, should never discount the possibility of infection. So we still have to pr practice good technique like many of your uh, colleagues and all people in the audience know. Uh, will have to keep the dialysis solution um, when it's not being used, capped off. And so that, you know, there's no chance for that going in. But once you have that cap, you know, you can minimize the likelihood of anything going in and you're able to carry out most of your normal activities, whether it's a shower or potentially swimming. In theory. Again, these are all statements that we have to prove, but I think we can speculate that by the design of IHEMO, some of the risks that people are thinking about could be mitigated, at least in principle. So in a way, this kind of leads into a discussion that's kind of very dear to my heart and, and that people are always asking about um, in terms of when are we going to be able to use this? When do we see this? And so one thing that I, I can remember, I have had the privilege of being in your lab, looking at these products and, and, and meeting the scientists that are researching all of the various aspects. And you just talked about one or two in terms of infection, but the complexity of this tiny little device is mind blowing. It, it's truly amazing. And every tiny little thing, every connection you just talked about, mm -hmm. every layer of the filter, all of those require specific testing, research and development and testing and retesting. And, you know, that's why it's not so easy. It's, you know, you look at the device and you think, oh, that's easy. I'll just, you know, but it's not. It, and, and so I think it's really important. And it's the hardest thing to comprehend from a patient perspective as to how much detail has to be hammered out that is so minute but critical, you know, just like you talked about the infection, the ability to, you know, uh, block some of that out, uh, the steps that are taken. And so, you know, maybe you can just help elaborate a little bit on that so patients can kind of get a picture of some of what I've seen. Right. So I think it's a great question. And I think, um, you know, the point you bring up is, you know, how is me how medical devices built? So I think we should distinguish between the research proof of concept you know, I'd also call it, you know, clinical proof of concept and commercial proof of concept. And there are three distinct sort of milestones there. So many of what you read about in papers in, 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 uh, and here on the news or reading science journals, where there's a breakthrough, it's usually about the research proof of concept. And hey, whether it's COVID diagnostics or COVID drugs or vaccines, first you got to get through a research proof of concept. Then you have to go into a clinical proof of concept, which involves patients, and then a commercial proof of concept. And I think the pandemic was quite illustrative because it showed that once you have the proof of research proof of concept, which is what you know Pfizer and BioNTech did, then there's so many resources thrown at it that they said, okay, we gotta take, we gotta deal with this. This is impossible. People are dying, obviously. This is bringing the whole world to a standstill. And then they accelerated to a clinical proof of concept, which means clinical studies and clinical trials. And then they had to scale up and make it a commercial proof of concept. So now, you know, anybody who wants a vaccine gets one. So I think it's important to understand that most of the work we've done is really at that early stage, the research proof of concept and moving towards the clinical proof. But so the research proof is well, as we showed in that video, you know, we've built a device and we've actually tested this in animals. We can actually put it, the filter inside pigs. We can get catheters out, connect to a little pump for moving dialysate, show that we can clear toxins. 
and there's no adverse effects. Okay. And so we're really, yeah, this is great. This is to us, to us and most academic labs, that's usually where they stop. But that's not where we want to stop because we need to get this to patients. So our goal is to get to clinical proof of concept. Now, when you're talking about clinical proof of concept, you have to get this to a point where the FDA will say, yes, you can test this on humans. And then after that, you can do enough to get it out to a market. So in that journey, you have to be very careful about how you build your devices and how you test them. So as in the research proof of concept, the goal is, hey, does this work in principle? Then when you think about humans, and we should all be aware of this, obviously, and I, I take it seriously, is that we have to be do the best we can to handle chances of things not working, to be sort of colloquial about it. So every connection, every membrane we have to inspect, then, then we have to put it together and then inspect again. Something goes wrong, okay? Then you have to redo it again, okay? And the interesting thing is filters with silicon membranes like we have don't exist. You just don't go buy this off a shelf. And some of you may be wondering, well, you know, go get a company to do it. Absolutely, that's what I thought. And initially the idea was, you know what, let's get companies to do this for us. Well, we went around and we went to a number of companies and said, look, we, we know how to do a lot of things in medical. We don't know how to do things with silicon semiconductor membranes for filtration. So we go to the other group that knows a lot about semiconductor, which is the electronics industry. <laughs> and like, yes, help us. They're like, hey, we know how to put stuff together, but we don't know how to do stuff that so it's compatible with blood. So we actually went around and that's the message you're hearing. So we said, okay, what will it take if we have you guys take this on? And the answer universally was some form of, yes, we can do it. It will take us time to figure it out. You'll have to pay us to do it. And since nobody's done before, it, we can't really guarantee anything. So once we heard that, having not much in the way of resources, we said, well, maybe what we should do is see what we can do to advance it ourselves. And so that's what we've done is basically said, okay, let us take it to clinical proof of concept and do this in the lab. So as you, when you visited, you saw my staff, professional staff, some graduate students, some postdoctoral trainees, some clinicians, some PhD <laughs> students, all working together with the understanding that we're going towards a clinical proof of concept. And they are also, like the companies, they also have to figure this out. But because it is not, there's no book to, to follow, we kind of have to write the book as we go. Yeah. And sometimes you have to take a step or two steps back before we move forward. And that is why it takes time. And, yeah. But again, it is meticulous and will not go to that final stage unless we feel confident that we've addressed the challenges that have to be addressed. So several people have been writing in questions uh, again about the difference between IHEMO. Um, we, we talked a little bit about the par uh, comparing it to peritoneal dialysis versus hemodialysis, um, the differences. But someone asked, which is really interesting, would you have to remove the IHEMO or would, you know, if when the implantable kidney becomes available or can you just add on to the IHEMO? So I think that's kind of an interesting concept. It is an interesting comment. And this is, this is really <laughs> fascinating. I, you know, yep. Again, guys, this is how we get ideas, right? We all talk about stuff. And um, before I sort of go to that question, this is exactly how IHEMO came about because somebody said, gosh, this stuff you're doing in the implantable artificial kidney, you're gonna have to require cells. Kidney cells are coming from cadavers or they have to come from stem cells. Those are not necessarily readily available. Can't you do something with just half? And then maybe you'll figure out, you know, once the cells come, you'll make the other half work. So that's what led to Ahimo. So the question is, you know, can we go back the other way? I mean, the, the short answer is as a research proof of concept, we can absolutely try. Because what you do is hack, add another piece. But as a clinical proof or commercial proof, you'll have to do the work such that you are now thinking of a completely different product. You might say, yes, maybe I'll add the cells, will it go inside? We've, it will add to the overall size if we just decide to add it on, um, like you know, slap it on. 
our feeling is that if we have to think about the implantable artificial kidney, it's more compact and it's optimized for operation with the filter, not for dialysis, but for ultrafiltration. Just a little bit of a primer for some of you in the audience. Our native kidneys work on ultrafiltration through the filter unit of the kidney called the glomerulus. And then the tubule component of the kidney provides the other metabolic function. And the ultrafiltration is a pressure-driven removal of water and toxins and small solutes from blood. Dialysis on the other hand, you do remove some of the water by pressure, but most of it is just by this process that physicists call diffusion, or scientists call diffusion. So physiologically, dialysis is not the, the case because it's not physiologic. And that's one of the reasons, you know, dialysis has its issues. On the other hand, ultrafiltration or hemofiltration for some of you who follow the terminology is how the kidneys work. In the implantable artificial kidney, we do ultrafiltration, basically like the native kidney does it under pressure. And you generate a lot of watery ultrafiltrated toxins. And then the cell component, the bioreactor, process the ultrafiltrate, gulps back, reabsorbs back much of that water, much of the salts that are needed by the body, so you don't dehydrate, and then remaining is get, gets concentrated into urine, into the bladder. So that's how the implantable artificial kidney works, and that's how our native kidneys operate. Hemodialysis, and iHemo is not, that is it's still dialysis, not um, hemofiltration, basically uses dialysis fluid to generate a concentration gradient to pull the toxins from blood. So it's operating more like regular dialysis. So if we, so the question is, can we then say, unless we have the eye chemo filter, can we slap on the cell unit? In theory, you might be able to say, yes, we could, but I don't think necessarily that's the way to go because the filter for eye hemo, as much as it's derived from the implantable artery kidney has been optimized for dialysis. Whereas to go back to the implantable, we need to want optimized for ultrafiltration. So I would say, well, it will be a good research and we will do it when the time comes, it will not likely be the product direction. We'll probably have to build the eye hemo as its and standalone and the implantable artificial kidney as its standalone. So getting back down to the nitty gritty, if you were using the eye hemo and you're um, a lot of patients that are doing dialysis and eye hemo is going to be a di dialysis type device, <clears throat> may or may not have residual function. They may not be able to be, or they might. So are, is the eye hemo able to remove that fluid that is uh, done during dialysis for someone who doesn't uh, eat? <clears throat> yeah, that's a great question. So the question is, you know, can you do ultrafiltration if you don't have any residual function to remove excess fluid? And very much like regular dialysis, hemodialysis, you run dialysis, but then you also put a negative pressure of pressure there you go. to pull the water out, right? And so you can actually apply the same type of pressure through the dialysis pump on the implanted filter. Again, this is just basically pump mecha mechanics. So by adjusting this negative pressure you apply to the um, dialysis fluid, you will generate a pressure differential from blood towards the dialysate solution. And that, in addition to bringing the toxins out, will also pull water. And that's how you'll be able to achieve, you know. And that is released through the second catheter that pulls the, the dialysate out of the body, just like it does now. And we know, that's you know, right. there it is, it's gone. Yeah. So now, interestingly, if you then move to the implantable kidney <clears throat> and you're going through the same process, and you're removing the fluids or the, you know, through the toxin does now, is that connected to the bladder? And, and that person now releases it through urine instead of, you know, since it's a, an actual kidney sure. function. Sure. So yeah, in the implantable artificial kidney, you're basically taking the excess fluid and directing it through the, from the device, from the implantable artificial kidney into the bladder and 
hopefully the person has enough you know, muscle sphincter so they can actually urinate. So you will not need a connection in the implantable artificial kidney to anything external. You'll be able to remove that excess fluid that comes out from the device through the, and discharge it through the bladder. You know, so the implantable is also going to be a great bridge, you know, to people who say are waiting for a living donor or you know, a match down the road but to keep the rest of the function, the bladder, uh, all working while they're, they're waiting for a human transplant. <laughs> yeah. So in both cases, I think we all have to recognize that the, the need to remove excess water is critical. In fact, that's where we all know challenges with kidney patients because the excess water builds up, causes your heart to work extra hard and has all the other kinds of issues. So ultrafiltration is very important. Now, the filter technology, as I've said, is similar, right? In both cases. Uh, so the holes, the pores in the eye hemofilter are large enough to let the toxins and urea to come through as well as water, but will not let red blood cells will not, will not leak albumin, you're not, you, but you will remove phosphorus. So, and if you to remove water, you just control it by dialing on your pump of how much water you wanna remove. And that will then go through an algorithm that will say, okay, you wanna remove X liters. So here's how much the pump will set. Now, this is um, engineering that has to be done, and, but it has been done by others. So we'll take the same type of technology that's developed for pumps and the knowledge that's been around for how do you uh, generate negative pressure uh, and use that to pull uh, water from the patient uh, into from the blood side into the dialysis side. That's fantastic. Um, so can patients switch from one mode to the other, peritoneal to ahemo, excuse me, and back? I mean, in principle, the question I think is, you know, could you, if you have both, you know, could you switch? And I think this is going to be a question for the patient and their doctor and, you know, why they should do it. So as we know, over time, many patients that do PD lose the efficacy or the potential for removing uh, toxins. And what we can do with PD is basically adjust that by adjusting the filtration outside. So if you had PD and you're losing function and you did eye hemo, yes, you could. Are you okay, Nilja? I think you're coughing, but I hope you're okay. Don't worry. You need to, if you need to go, to <laughs> video and get a glass, go get a glass of water, go get it. We'll be, I'll be happy to answer questions. So for everybody, as, as Nilja comes back, she'll get a glass of water. I think if you have PD and it's working, fine. You, if, you, if you're losing your PD and get eye hemo, there's a scenario where you might say, you know, I'll do both. Um, is there an interest in doing both? Initially, I don't know. I think that's going to depend on the patient and their doctor and where we are with the technology. But in principle, again, as a research proof of concept, we're going to try that. Those, you know, and I try to try those kinds of experiments well before they become clinical questions and get some insights onto it. I think it's important to recognize that how we, you know, the similarities between what we do with IHEMO and PD. So you have a sim you cannot use the same catheter because the PD catheter is going into the peritoneum. This is a different catheter. But if you're familiar with using PD, you like the flexibility that PD provides, the ability to you know, schedule your own treatments, the ability to take a, a, the machine and travel readily. That is what you'll get with IHEMO. And what you can avoid with with uh, with uh, with IHEMO that you can avoid it. PD is, you know, you'll be you'll be able to get the kinds of prescriptions for um, hemodialysis that allow you to live that that, that allow you to live a more um, normal life as as you will need to. So I think IHEMO, as as it's been around, is a concept. We're moving forward. And I'm going to go through another question that I see that's coming through. You know, 
uh, we asked about the water removal. And then, you know, I have somebody has questions about PB and glucose levels are getting higher. So obviously in hemodialysis, we don't have to have, we don't have to deal with this. We're not doing dealing with uh, the solutions that have a lot of glucose, but doing a regular dialysis solutions. So the challenges of PD solutions and their side effects on the peritoneum, their side effects on the patient, we completely avoid with eye hemo. Again, the idea is it's going to be dialysis, dialysis as it is done with a hemodialysis system, but with the flexibility of choosing your schedule and doing this, I like to say, conveniently, safely, and as frequently as you need to. And one of the motivations for us that have driven our work is the ability to do more frequent dialysis for those that benefit from more frequent sessions, as well as, as, well as longer sessions. As some of you may already know, there's a lot of data out there that has shown that if you can dialyze patients in some of these clinical studies from Canada, from Virginia, United States, from France, overnight, or at least six to eight hours a night, for say five or six days a week, some of these patients just feel so much better. The health is so much more improved, okay? And so for those types of patients, iHemo is something that they can use, I think, when, when, when it comes about. So I'm looking at another question. So is the pump working at all times and how long are the treatments? Uh, when Nilja comes back, I think hopefully she'll address this, but not every dialysis patient, as she has told me, is the same. Patients are different. People need different, for some people, it's three times a week, for others, it's seven days a week. So the question, Nilja, is, you know, how long are the treatments? I think what IHEMO will ultimately allow is you to customize what works for you. And if you're able, Nilja, and your coughing fit is, then I'd like for you to talk a little bit about you know, the need to personalize treatments and how currently it's almost like one thing for everybody, but you are very familiar with the need to customize treatments. So be, tell us a little more. You're on mute, yeah. Nilja, you're on mute. Uh. <laughs> Nilja, you're on mute. Uh. Sorry, I, now you're back. I'm back. <laughs> Welcome. For, for the benefit of the audience, I, I got delayed on my travels last night, got in at two of this morning, so I'm not at my best. <laughs> you're doing but, great. but anyway, so customization is key. Um, we all know that. And ironically, I've done a lot of research on this, but the three days a week, four hour treatment has no medical or scientific basis. It was actually done back in the 80s for scheduling purposes. And so that's the traditional um, diet, uh, prescription for most dialysis. Nothing medical behind it, which I find very distressing. So to have something like IHEMO, where it's gonna determine how it works with your body. So again, you know, you say you have some residual function, you might have an acute injury where you don't need to <clears throat> completely supplement all of your residual, your, your kidney function. <clears throat> doing a little bit less with IHEMO might be perfect for you. It, say you've had lost your kidneys, have dialyzed for 20 years, being able to do overnight, gently sleeping in a small machine, you know, portable, that would be perfect for you seven days a week without being um, really obtrusive. So again, the ability to detail that treatment is critical. And I know that, that that's going to be one of the advantages to IHEMO. So Nilja, um, one of the things is, you know, we talk about patients and, you know, I have sort of gotten the feedback from a number of patients about the, the needle phobia and the need to be able to travel. Could you just talk to us a little bit about those on the audience that are not necessarily patients about how those two factors, the portability and needle phobia 
and how important are they to, from the from patient side? So needle phobia, unfortunately, is probably one of the biggest deterrents for patients to go home. And we have talked um, at length about, you know, to people, it's, you have to basically mentally prepare yourself. Once you get past that fear, and we have tons and tons of patients who've done this that, that literally would pass out um, with needles, <coughs> but they're able to actually self cannulate. And once you've done it and you have that power and control, you'll never let anybody else put a needle in you again. It, it, it's, it's a mind over matter issue and most every own patient has to overcome it. And they, and they do um, because you have to want it that bad. But the other side of that is the ability to continue with your life, to travel, to work, to raise your family, to go to school, whatever it is that you were doing before you lost your kidney function, you should be able to continue to do. And the only way you can do that is with portability of treatment. I mean, being locked into three days a week, having to go to a clinic and being told when to be there and when <clears throat> you need to leave, it just doesn't work. So something like this goes with the natural rhythm of your body. You go to sleep at night, you do your dialysis, you get up in the morning, you continue with your work. This is what patients want. We know this. You know, thank you. And I think it was, good, it was so inspiring for us to hear from patients in your community um, about, you know, what they really want. And I think one of the things that was, that struck me, and this is from a patient, um, was we know you guys are working towards an implantable artificial kidney. We know you want to make a kidney, but guys, what is the, you know, don't worry about trying to make everything perfect. Get to, to be good yeah. enough. So whether it's for the implantable artificial kidney or IHEMO, for us, it's about, you know, what can we get then? How can we enable a benefit? No. So even the idea for avoiding needles for us, which frankly, as an engineer, not a patient, <laughs> most, people, most people sort of gloss over that. And now it's a needle, right? People get shots all the time. Obviously, they don't get shots three times a week with a big you know, needle. Engaged needle, right? <laughs> so it struck me and talking with the patient groups how important it was to take that perspective. And then we put our heads together and said, okay, what can we do? And that's the idea of IHEMO. So I think we can deliver on the needle-free concept just by the design. We can deliver on the fact that you have something that's smaller that can travel uh, because we are just moving the dialysis pump with you. And hopefully you can you know, customize the treatments as you need to. So one, one, one thing that has come and it's a question that is coming up is, well, if that's the case, you've got this implanted filter, well, how do you need to, how often do you need to change the filter? And I'll give the answer that I've talked when I talked about implantable artificial kidney. Guys, the truth is, you know, we don't know for sure, but we're designing this, this is gonna be a long-term implant. And we are guided by the knowledge that's there in the development of stents pacemakers, artificial hearts, and the like. And the, you know, because those devices have been around and they have improved okay. materials, they've improved designs such that people are there with pacemakers for a decade or more. You know, stents, sometimes even longer. So we are building on that and not having to discover all that knowledge. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that at some point we'll get to a place where, yes, we, you know, it takes once every 10 years. But as engineers, we have to take into account things can fail. And some of you who are engineering in the audience know something called MTBF, mean time between failures. So you want to extend it as long as possible. So working with Nilja's group and some of the other patient groups, you know, we ended up serving patients and said, look, if we have to go through a surgical procedure and you know this thing can fail, what kind of target should we aim for that would tell you guys that it's worth you know, doing this? Basically, what's an acceptable time before it might fail and you'd still consider doing a surgery? And it's interesting because first, you know, we heard from patients, you know, hey, 
if this is going to free me from coming in center three times a week, I can come in for three times a month. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. Or I can come in three times a year. Then we heard from other people who were like, well, gosh, especially in the clinical, this has to last for 10, 15 years. And we said, okay, let's conduct a scientific survey. So I recruited a colleague of mine at here at UCSF. And we came up with a survey, a scientific survey, and we sent it out to over two or 3,000 patients. We got responses from, from about 1,000. And I think when we called down the people who had completed the whole form, it was close to 500. And we went through the scientific analysis. And we presented the res these results at the American Society of Nephrology meeting in 2019. But what was interesting to me, and this has really blew my mind away, um, is in this scientific survey, basically patients were willing to accept a greater risk of death. Again, you have to ask these questions in a way that you can tease that information out. But we're willing to accept a greater risk of death if you could provide the mobility. Yep. Right? They're like, and, and again, you talk to some patients mm -hmm. anecdotally, they say, yeah, you know, I, you know, this is so miserable. I want to have a better life for the time I'm around. So we found out that the vast majority of patients in that survey say to us, if the device operated for up to two years and I had to come in for a surgery to change the filter, if you will, and in the other times I didn't have to go to the center for my in-center treatments, it, it lets me do all the, uh, all the good things that I've read about from people who have done these nocturnal hemodialysis studies in different parts of the world. Yeah, I would be willing to come in for a surgery. That just changed how we think about it. So here we've got real patient information that a plurality or majority of the patients will be willing to accept something that doesn't have to work for 10 years, as long as you can provide the benefit. Now we'll still aim for a long time, but it opened my eyes that you know, the way you go about designing something that's going to last 10 years versus what you design something lasts at five years is different. And something that lasts, supposed to last 50 years is very different than something that lasts, you know, seven years. So it simplifies and also guides us. So that is what is guiding us towards that. So it's not like we think it's going to fail in two years, but at least we know that patients are willing to consider the treatment and also maybe communicates to me as a scientist and engineer how bad the situation is with regular incident dialysis, maybe and that we need to do something different and we need options. You know, another way maybe to think about it as from the patient perspective, um, risk benefit, but currently with you access, you normally would at least be going for procedures anywhere from three, four times a year. Um, you might even have revisions. So it's not something we're not used to. Uh, you know, to have minor surgery <clears throat> to repair your, your fistula. If you have a peritoneal catheter, the same thing, there'll be placements, they'll have to go in and do adjustments. So these are all things that we already deal with. Um, but the difference is, of course, if you were doing it with IHEMO, the benefit is that the rest of the time, you're basically carefree. Yeah, you don't, you're not tied to anything except when you're sleeping. <clears throat> Yeah, and I know, I think, you know, we talk about the need to be able to eat and drink freely, the ability to travel. I think the eat and drink freely part really struck me because after I, until I talked to patients, I didn't know how restrictive your diets were for most of the patients that are for the in-center. I mean, they're controlling what they drink, they're controlling what they eat. I mean, somebody told me they hadn't had a pizza in years, <laughs> and the bananas they worry about, potatoes. So, you know, I don't think most of the people out there who don't who are not familiar with the condition understand this and improving the quality of life is so important. So when I thought about, okay, we can get away with needle phobia by avoiding needles also struck me that, you know, what people want to do is travel. So one of the key parts for us is yes, ultimately, the, you know, we may have to do this in the stages, first build a filter with a bulkier bedside unit, but the goal is to get to something that you can carry around because that is important. Uh, and then you have something that can allow the freedom that a patient deserves. Absolutely. And that's, that is the number one goal, just as you said, patients rank freedom 
before anything else. It's, you know, the FDA came up with a study that did a similar type evaluation. And, and paid, whereas doctors, professionals, they normally look at mortality as the, the goal. They, they want to preserve life at all costs. Patients, number one is to be able to live our lives. They want travel. They want freedom. They want the ability to work and, and live. And that is number one. And they put mortality at the bottom of the list. You know, that is not what we're concerned about any near as much as that the time that we're living is quality life. That's yeah. key. Yeah, and I think, I think we have to, as, as, as technology innovators, as biomedical engineers, as clinicians, colleagues uh, that I have, we should be aware that that's really important. And I think finally with some of the work we've done with you and other groups, we we'll bring patient group patients to meet with the physicians and the patients to meet with the technology developers. Yeah, that has led to some of my most um, exciting sort of thoughts about how to move the technology forward. And it has actually led to some initiatives, right? It has led yeah. to this now kidney X, it has led to you know kidney health initiatives. These are initiatives that did not exist 10 years ago. And yeah. it talks a little bit about you know, what we need to do in the kidney space and not just here, the kidney project, but across it, we are one amongst others. And we want to be all thinking about how to address the burdens of kidney disease. We are real truly in exciting times right now in terms of innovation in the kidney space. Um, you know, we went almost 50 years and with nothing. It was, dialysis was basically done the same way, you know, 20 years ago or even 10 years ago as it was 50 years ago. And all of a sudden we've had a proliferation of new dialysis machines, new uh, means of transplant, xenotransplant, uh, the implantable, the iHemo, all of these new devices and innovation have entered the space since I've been working. And, and that to me has been one of the most exciting things about the work that we do at Home Dialyzers. I'm sure it is for you, um, you know, to leave patients with hope that uh, while we may not have seen progress before, I'm truly convinced that in the next 10 years, we're going to see the entire face of the, the, the kidney space uh, undergo a transition. Yeah, I'm hopeful. And I want, one of the questions that has come up is, you know, how long will this take? I think I should again reframe uh, this, the context of, you know, we are one of multiple efforts and the field of kidney has been traditionally challenged because there's been a lack of investment, whether it's private yeah. or government. So, you know, iHemo, implantable artificial kidney, they're all part of this spectrum where we're trying to raise the awareness. So it is really important for everybody that's listening to be able to advocate why we need to change. And yes, whether it's iHemo, implantable artificial kidney, more portable dialysis units, you know, Xeno, whatnot, we all are in this together. We want to improve it. We think that we can get the iHemo through to clinical trials, you know, in the next in a handful of years or less, but it's going to require resources. I always hate to give the exact time because if I don't get the resources, it stretches out. And you've heard me on prior YouTube saying that we come up with plans that are in the best case scenarios, and then we don't get the money and it gets stretched. And obviously not everybody's happy, including us. But with iHemo, we have shown research proof of concept. We now need to move towards clinical proof of concept. And once we have the clinical proof of concept and with some of these initiatives that are being put into place, largely because of advocacy efforts, we think they'll be you know, moving to the commercialization side. And once that happens, it will move to a product, not only within the United States, our hope is it goes across the world. We've I've seen questions in the chat, will it be marketed outside? I can speak that as a developer, we don't have, we're not limited to where we want this to go. You know, it will, there's a business component to it, it's gonna require effort. But again, this is about execution and finding the resources to execute. And as we raise the awareness of kidney disease and bring more uh, supporters, whether it's advocates and funders and government, private industry, we'll get there. I agree. And one thing that patients can do um, is constantly stay in touch with your congressional representatives. For every one letter that you write that says, you know, please help the kidney space. We want to see more investment in uh, research dollars. 
for every one letter that one of you writes, that represents a thousand constituents. They take these letters very seriously. Um, we've been working on this for years. And one of the hardest things is for patients to understand that their voice counts. So, you know, if I leave one thought, it would be that you must, you know, ask for what we need. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, to end this, yes, we do have uh, grants that have supported the work, but to really move this to a clinical you need. group and beyond, you need investors. Yep. And, you know, the investors have to drive this because it's not, we talked about how meticulously you have to do it. At some point, you got to bring in and just make it somebody's mission. Like we're going to make this in a reliable and a manufacturable way. And for that, we need to be able to find resources. And we would hope that there'll be investors that will then take it from our lab and move it to the commercial side. And we'll be part of it and sharing the information, but then it'll get to everything, every, the whole world. So I'll say that, you know, how long will it take is a question of, you know, how is the investment climate around this? And for those of you who know something about investment, you want to encourage them to come here, have them reach out. We are happy. And this is, you know, to find partners that will move IHIMO towards a clinical proof of concept and beyond. Great. Well, time has flown. Oh my yes. goodness. Yeah. <laughs> so it's been a pleasure, uh, Nilja. And, uh, you know, thank you for doing this. I know you must be very tired. And um, so, but we're really glad to speak with you. And it's always a pleasure. If I hadn't been quite so tired from traveling in the middle of the night, I, you know, we'd probably be going on forever. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Talk to you soon, Shuvo. Have a great one. Take yeah, care. Take care, everybody. See you next month.